What ideas do you hold about Africa and those who come from Africa? Are your ideas up to date? Find out on Talking with Henrietta, coming up next. Hi, I'm Henrietta. Welcome to the show. This past January, hundreds of people attended the fourth annual African Diaspora Investment Symposium. The symposium was held over two days at the Computer Museum in Mountain View. On this show, we'll talk about the symposium and any impact it might hold for all of us. I have two guests with me for our discussion. Almaz Nagash and Shum Jin. Almaz, who is seated to my left, is the founder and executive director of the African Diaspora Network. She is an executive in residence at the School of Global Innovation and Leadership at Lucas College and Graduate School of Business at San Jose State University. She holds an MBA from Golden Gate University and a bachelor's degree from the University of San Francisco. She is a member of the UN Economic Commission for Africa's high-level panel on migration. Trum Jin is the chief technology officer at Goldwater Capital, an early-stage venture capital firm focused exclusively on consumer tech companies. He holds the firm's technology strategy and works with its portfolio of companies. Chum was an engineer at Google for eight years, and while there, he led the development of Google's consumer payments platform, building a large-scale service that would power Google Play, YouTube, and Google Apps payments, processing over $8 billion in transactions annually. Chum holds a bachelor's in computer science from Dartmouth College and an MSc degree in software development management from Carnegie Mellon University. Well, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure yes. having you. Thank you for having us. Of course. Now, I said something, Chum, about um, your overseeing payments and the strategy of the firm. I don't think I said that quite correctly. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I guess we could, we could break that up into two separate statements. So payments was uh, my time at, at Google. Yes. So I worked on the payments platform that Google uh, uses to process consumer-facing payments. And uh, overseeing strategy is what I do today at Goodwater Capital, which is the venture capital firm at which I work. And when we talk about overseeing strategy, what are we talking about? Well, so. Venture capital firms will typically have some sectors that they invest in. Goodwater Capital focuses on consumer technology, and technology is my expertise. It's the area in which I've had a lot of experience over the years. So as part of my work at the firm, we, we evaluate the technical capabilities of the various companies that we consider for investing. And we also help these companies once we've invested in them. So help them on the technology strategy to make sure that they succeed. Sure. Now, when I, uh, in the introduction, I talked about people's ideas about Africa, it's generally accepted that Africa is the cradle of civilization. And 2,000 years ago, there was a Roman author, Pliny, the elder, who said, there are always new things that come out of Africa. Do you find that in your experience? <laughs> <laughs> so I am from Africa, so I will not be objective to the answer, but I think that humanity started in Africa. 
I say this when you hit the drum, the heart beats, and that's the heart of Africa. Wherever you are and you hear the drum, that reminds me of the continent mostly. So I think humanity really, in my opinion, started in Africa, but then who am I? To, I'm not and, the objective and, uh, person, uh, uh, but it is actually true. Well, I think you know more about Africa than most of our listeners. So when you say, who are you? So, well, but I mean that it is uh, my home continent. I come originally from Eritrea, Northeast Africa, so north of Ethiopia. And uh, yeah, as a, it, it's a continent, it's not a country. So Africa is a massive continent with about 54 countries and close to a billion people oh. and growing oh. and uh, very diverse. Yes. Uh, we are diverse in culture, religion, ethnicity. Um, so it's uh, as complex and as beautiful as you can find. Sure. Would you like to add, Shum? I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I share Alma's sentiment in that I'm also going to be somewhat biased. That's, uh, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I, was, I was born in, in Ghana, which is slightly to the south and a bit to the west of where Alma's was born, on the coast of Africa. And yes, we've had several civilizations that have risen and fallen on the West African coast. Um, but you look at even Egypt, you look at the pyramids and the, the empires that existed there. And I think there's a lot that supports the statement that it is the cradle of civilization. Yes, yeah. it, it was, um, I guess, the height of culture before the Greeks and Romans. Right. Exactly. That's not what we often get in the history books, however. <laughs> but no. <laughs> that's so a very different history. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, um, learning from the African diaspora, what is the diaspora? So, a diaspora, in a way, are, is just an immigrant who came, uh, left their home country in search of, could be economic, for economic reasons, uh, educational reasons or it could be also political reasons so those are people who left home and called so in our case it would be the United States is now our home so I came as a foreign student uh, to study in the US and so I stayed here married my husband have my children and so you were part of the brain drain right <laughs> we are part of the brain drain I, I yes we are bring all of your talents bring all of your talent. over here exactly exactly well Ghana has a lot to say about that but I'll, I'll let I'll let Trump talk about that um, so I think um, in our case just to be very clear about what the diaspora and I think it's a very good question and it's also one that's not very well understood in our uh, in in the Africa diaspora sense so the, the so you have historical diaspora historical African uh, diaspora in the United States those are African Americans who came here was was out their own permission to leave their continent yes. the, the historical through slavery yes, the slaves exactly yes. so that's the historical uh, diaspora and then we Truman and I and others we're the contemporary diaspora, so who left the continent probably in the last maybe 40, 50 years, uh, came here for educational reasons, as I said earlier, could be also for political reasons, for other different reasons people migrate. We migrated to the United States for many different reasons, but we are the contemporary. So to say that I am benefiting and I am what I am personally on the back of the African Americans who came here before us to pave the way for for my community and many others in some ways. But those are the historical diaspora, and I consider myself very privileged to be the contemporary, really pretty much benefiting you know, of the work that they've done. Has been at war. <laughs> for how many years? Yes, and this you probably came during that time. So Were yeah, I came in 19... No, no, oh. I wasn't... Uh, yeah, I'm one of the very few people who is not a refugee. I actually left home uh, pretty much privileged uh, by airplane. You said airplane. to your education. Yeah, I left home in 1984 after I finished high school. I went from uh, uh, Eritrea, Asmara, straight to Athens, and then from them to Holland. So I studied in Amsterdam for three and a half years. So my journey is way easier than many who suffer to get here and go through so many different challenges. So I actually had the fortune 
of not having to suffer or come here as a refugee. So I came here from Holland to USF, uh, to uh, San Francisco as a foreign student. Speaking how many languages along the way? <laughs> so I, you know, I speak Eritrean, so the Tigrinya for Eritrea and Ethiopian Amharic language, which was a must because Eritrea was under Ethiopian administration for many years. Even when I left home, we were still under Ethiopian administration. Right now, Eritrea is separate from Ethiopia, but I can speak the language. And then I spoke and uh, read Dutch very well, although now it's almost gone. Uh, I can read it, but it's very difficult to speak it. And then, of course, English. Yes, and Joom, <laughs> your story in terms of, yes. or anything you'd like to say also about the diaspora? Well, I, I think Almas did an amazing job of describing or explaining uh, the diaspora as we see it. And um, I will add to that that being a part of the diaspora also creates itself a sense of community, right? So the, the, the thing we share is we, we did come from different countries, but we came from a continent that has similar struggles, similar opportunities, and there's that shared experience that we've gone through that creates a sense of community, right? And of course, it also creates a sense of community because we, we still consider our homes, part of our homes, to be on that continent, right? And, and that's, that's a big reason why the Africa Diaspora Network exists. Um, in terms of my background or my history, I also came here for school. So right after high school, I um, first went to, to England for a bit and then started college in uh, Dartmouth, right, on the East Coast. And so I was also very privileged that a lot of Africans who move or migrate to the United States for other reasons, sometimes outside of the control. It's, it's economic opportunities. But for me, it was education. Um, it, did, it did so happen that the program that I was interested in pursuing, which is electrical engineering, was something that was not very strong in my country. So it was also sort of a better opportunity for me to come here. But then after that, I got into computer science. Um, and, and that really sort of dictated my trajectory going forward. Um, so so that's, been, that's been my, my history coming here. Sure, and usually people get a master's degree, uh, master's of science. I, I was intrigued that yours was an MSc, and so I mm. had to look up MSc. <laughs> <laughs> what did you find? I'll let Joom talk yeah, about so, the so difference <laughs> between master of science and an MSc degree. Well, it is a master's the of science, same. actually. Um, it's mm. just uh, in Carnegie Mellon. The Carnegie Mellon offers a degree that allows you to take some interdisciplinary courses with what they would typically offer in an MBA program. Because especially here in Silicon Valley, they recognize that technology and business are very interrelated, right? And so they, they, the program is structured so that you can uh, do a traditional computer science, a master's in science degree, but then you can take some courses in the business discipline as well and, and learn something about management, and that's what I did. It's absolutely fascinating, fascinating backgrounds. <laughs> <laughs> and talking about the diaspora, we then get to the African Diaspora Network. And so what's that all about? So the Africa Diaspora Network started about 10 years ago, nine years ago, I should say nine years ago. We have one more year to go to be 10, but nine years ago. Well, things are going so fast anyway. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Um, when it started, um, I think, uh, to be frank, out of frustration. So I, uh, again, I had also the privilege and the opportunity to work uh, in many different places in Silicon Valley. But at the time, I was uh, at the Markula Center for Applied Ethics. I was the director of the Global Leadership and Ethics. And through that wonderful uh, work uh, experience, I've also met some really good people who are trying to do good things in Africa. Eventually, as I uh, noticed, there was a lot of uh, people who really mean well, wanting to do social entrepreneurship. And every time you see a social entrepreneur trying to do something in Africa, they were not Africans. And we, the Africans, were not a part of the discussion. I just said, wait a second. This community, my husband is here. There are the Chums and many other Africans from the diaspora. Why are we at the table talking about Africa? Now, when you talk about social entrepreneurship, 
explain it. So for social entrepreneurs, no. That's good. <clears throat> social entrepreneurs are individuals who have either business or other background or have skills that they are very good at, but they want to use that skill to make a difference in the community. So that term social entrepreneurship or social entrepreneur comes not because they are already entrepreneurs, but you add social to it, they really are working for the common good. So really trying to make a difference in the like community. Maybe many nonprofits. Yeah, it's an it, well. But it could be nonprofit. What, well, it's called. It could also be a big corporate. So Alma, is it, when you talk about people being at the table and people making the decisions and people in Africa trying to do good, isn't that typical of? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I know, it is. I mean, historically? It is, uh, but I wanted to be at the table. I did not want, you know, I want to be part of the decision making that impacts my community, whether it's locally here or globally. If it's something that I can contribute to it, <clears throat> I want to be a part of it. But I also know that complaining doesn't take you anywhere. So I just brought in about 15 people uh, that I know and can tell me whether this is a good idea or not. Um, I ask them, you know, what would it look like if we can create an African diaspora network, just a community network for us to bring Africans and friends of Africa together. But there's a much bigger picture to this. Uh, the, the, the idea is that if you don't know who I am, if I don't know what you do, we might not have a dialogue. We don't even know how to communicate with each other. But the platform, the African Diaspora Network platform, is really created to bring all the diverse communities together. We, the diaspora, to work with friends of Africa, the social entrepreneurs, the investors, the entrepreneurs in general, um, to make a difference in the continent, but also in the community where we live. So for us, it's not a zero-sum game. We want to make a difference in this community. For example, for Chum and I, we live in Silicon Valley. We want to be able to make a difference here because this is where we went to school, where our children and our family is. It is our community. But then we also belong to that home continent, to yes. Africa. We want to make a difference there. So, so we want to bring, we want to make the ADN a platform for all this to happen. Sure. Now, Chum, you're on the board. You're uh, yes, on I the am. board. And so. Did you start out on the board? <laughs> no. See, my, my, my tenure on the board has been for less than a year, actually, at this point. So I got involved a lot later. I've not been involved for all of the nine years, going on 10. <laughs> um, but I, my journey started with uh, this, this desire to reconnect. I think it's, like I said, it's, one of, it's the common thread that you'd find in the diaspora and also what Almaz mentioned, the Friends of Africa. So we see ADN as a platform for members of the diaspora, but for all other groups, all other communities that do care about what's happening on the African continent, wants to see that social social innovation that Almaz talked about. And he talked about the brain drain when we talked about coming here for, for education. And staying. And staying, right? And, and not Going back and to not your going country. back, and and I think that's one of the things that has always <laughs> nagged at me because I recognize that my skill set is is one thing that I could sort of offer back to my community in some way, and I've been able to build some amount of wealth for myself, and I want to be able to give back. And it's a it's a common theme that you see amongst the diasporans. They want to do something, even if they're not ready to move back, or for whatever reason they're not able to. They have such deep roots here. And that's where I was, right? So I, I recognized that I wanted to give back in some way, um, instead of getting involved in some NGOs. And then I found ADN and Almaz. And so I got involved as a volunteer in uh, one of the Africa Diaspora Investment Symposiums. This might have been maybe the first or something. 27, yeah, 20, 2016. 2016. Mm -hmm. So I started as a volunteer. Um, and then I started advising the organization. And eventually, I joined the board. Ah, amazing. He's our chair, just so he you know. Is He's a humble chair. man. Huh? He's the chair. You didn't just <laughs> join the board. <laughs> <laughs> he was selected to be the chair. Yes. Now, you yes. started. You called in 15 people. Yes. And right now, I think uh, last year, um, the, the symposium involved people from all over the world from Canada, from yes. Europe, from Africa, from America. How yes. do you start with 15 people <laughs> and expand the network uh, globally? 
So, no, I think it's what Chum is talking about. So you've got diasporans, we come from everywhere. So we've got 54, and sometimes we call 55 countries in, in, in Africa. We come from all part of that continent, and we're dispersed everywhere. And so when you create a platform that is mm. very inviting and conducive for discussion, um, I think uh, it's not me making it. I think it's the community making it happen. You, you have to have a big mailing list. Right. <laughs> so, so no. Yes, I think that's a very good point. The symposium is four years old. The organization is, in a way, eight years old. So we've uh, going nine, and it's really doing very well in a sense that it started very small. Uh, we start to connect from one person to the other to the other. So we actually have a mailing list of five thousand seven hundred people. We have really, people just register and sign up online and we get their emails, so we've got a very good listserv. And um, we have, um, I'll let you finish your sentence and then I'll talk about several of the photos that we have from oh, the symposium. Oh, from the symposium. So the symposium is just, um, it's our uh, uh, signature event where we really bring people together from many different places and it also has its own purpose and the whole idea is how do you bring all people you know diverse people together to connect with each other to learn from each other and to share resources and opportunities with so each other let let's look at a few photos that we have from the symposium and the first one we have is from the third year and uh, tell us something about that so I, I is if this is the banner, this is just the yes, banner for just, this year. This is a this banner. This is the banner for this year. The banner for this year, which has really the theme of this year. Every year, uh, the symposium have a theme. For this year, it was amplifying abundance in Africa on these four areas that we care about. So the human capital, entrepreneurship, innovation, and investment in the continent. Um, no, that's a. a photo from last year. This one is uh, a session on impact investment uh, that took place last year also at the uh, Computer History Museum in Mountain View. Okay, and the next one I know is from this year and it was a, a panel concerning women. Yes, you these talk are about women it? leaders, yes. Uh, and uh, you can see it's a very diverse community of women, um, incredible leaders. Uh, they come from Intel, eBay, Salesforce, and a uh, couple of them from different uh, organizations. The idea is how do we amplify and showcase the contribution of uh, Africans from the diaspora and friends of Africa to the uh, Silicon Valley and the U.S. economy. Yes, I know about these photos because I took them. <laughs> <laughs> Those are some good photos. <laughs> these are very good photos. And, and this is a good one. That was just one of the group um, yeah. and uh, of some of the audience. The audience And I know from nice. this, this distance, and this particular one is, you know who that is. You want to talk about him? Yes, so, so Aime is uh, a leader in, at Facebook. And he was one of our keynote speakers, and I think that's the, the photo that you captured. Um, and I, I think he gave a, a really great presentation, and this was continuing the theme of the diaspora in Silicon Valley and the impact that we're having there. So I, I thought he did an amazing job. He's also a, been a, a great supporter of the network as well. Mm -hmm. So I talked about, it, it when I started out, people's images of the continent. Have you run into stereotypes in terms of what you've been doing and who you are and what you represent? <laughs> yes, uh, but stereotypes, um, I used to get offended, uh, not anymore. And that's when I first came as a foreign student and I'm like, wait, you don't know where Africa is, you don't know where we, so you get to do that. But then as you grow older and start to understand, actually I took it as a job, as my responsibility to explain rather than to be defensive because I think the 
usually people going to stereotype just because they don't know or they don't understand you. And stereotype is also a sign of fear. And so instead of uh, being defensive and try to uh, minimize what they're saying, I actually go into a very long discussion. Oh, let me explain to you what Eritrea is, how we live, how all this thing. So I think eventually those very people who were stereotyping me actually ended up being my friends. So I think you this must is, have done it very, very well because well, I'm thinking, I <laughs> try explaining to other people who might be conservative <laughs> and then saying, yeah. well, they wound up as my friends. So evidently. Yes, not everyone, but many of, yeah, many people. Because I think, I, I, again, if you don't know, you don't know. In my opinion, but, those but who still... a lot of people don't know that they don't know. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. And so when you are, I think that this is probably common with many of us, when you are in a, in a conversation with someone who does not want to understand it, then you stop it. But at least, at least you try your best to really under, to explain what that is. So we don't live in trees. This is one of the things I heard. Uh -huh. Oh, really? When did you start to dress up or to oh, wear clothes? Oh. And so, how so, did you make it across the Atlantic Ocean? Yes, yeah, I mean, it's just <laughs> it's really swim? amazing. And so, no, no one actually asked. No, that that was pretty common in college, and yeah. you know, really? college for me was. Uh, well, how can someone swim across the Atlantic? Oh, oh, you had. Very powerful athletic skills. <laughs> <laughs> I, I imagine. I think yeah, anything is possible when you come from Africa. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's all that. I mean, the stereotype that Africans hear is not different than any other cultures here too so so it's it's uh, right. how you deal with it because it doesn't define us we know that yeah uh, so, our, so my, we're not we're not kind of unique in any way from that perspective in yeah. terms of the stereotypes we receive but I think to Alma's point um, often when I find that people are willing to even engage in the stereotype especially if it you can tell it comes from a good place. Like sometimes they're just really curious. Like, mm -hmm. wow, how did you learn how to speak English? When you, mm -hmm. you tell them, hey, you know, um, there were a lot of colonies in yeah. Africa, and some of them were Anglophone, <laughs> and some were not Francophone. I mean, but yeah. the fact that they're willing to ask that question says that they want to engage, and yeah. it's an opportunity to connect with them. And and often you can win them over. And in some cases, um, if I go all the way back to college, when I had interactions which were somewhat negative, um, the fact that they were willing to even keep teasing me meant that they wanted to interact somehow and that yeah. sometimes was an opportunity to to co-op some of them and and I, I certainly made some friends that way as well. That's great I would hate to know how you were teased. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um. <laughs> you can laugh about it now. <laughs> well I, I guess because it didn't really bother me mm -hmm. I, I, I think mm -hmm. what what did probably help a bit was that I knew it didn't really mean anything. Like it didn't change how I felt about myself or who I knew I was. Mm -hmm. um, but when I recognized, like some of them really just wanted to pick on you, but some were it was ignorance, but they're comfortable in their ignorance. And you probably you, you know what that is, right? They're, they say certain things and you, they know that it's wrong, <laughs> but they don't really care. Yeah. But I'll joke about it, and I would twisted in a different way and over time they were like hey you know this guy's kind of cool he's joking about it too and we we'll joke about it some more yeah and eventually they kind of learn what the real thing is and we become friends right well yeah. I, I I have to commend you it's some an, an amazing attitude <laughs> well I think it's uh, maybe this is the resilience of uh, immigrants in general but I think the contemporary diaspora has the privilege of knowing who we are right. where we came from I mean, that's the greatest privilege that we have, I think. We're not better, better than the historical diaspora or others. But I think the fact that we know who we are, where we came from, is in itself a strength that... You, that, that you have roots exactly. in terms of family and culture. Seven generation, I can go uh -huh. on and on. And that, I think, is very, very important. But the other thing is, like what Chung was talking about, it doesn't define you. It's just another thing you have to deal with. And then so you have a choice to make. Do you want to be angry and be defined by it? Or do you want to just explain and move on or make friendship out of it sometimes? Um, but these are not only to us, but it's also percolating in our children too. You know, they look like <laughs> us. They look like me and, you know, Truman. So uh, it's something that we, are aware of, uh, but again, it doesn't define who we are. And so the continent is um, 
what it is, and it has been the breadbasket of many, many other countries who came and colonized uh, many of the countries. So we, we've gone through a lot, and, uh, and, that the, uh, and Africa has the opportunity to, over, uh, to become another successful continent in its own way because of many. I, I do believe the diaspora will contribute tremendously to the development of Africa. Amazing. Just as much as we do, uh, I just want to also say this. People say, oh, you know, in the diaspora, you're thinking about Africa. No, no, no. We're actually contributing tre tremendously to the United States economy or any other so, part of so the world. So talk about that. Since you've been talking for a while, Al yeah. Mars, and I, wanna, I don't want you to feel left out, Truman. <laughs> uh, I don't feel left out. No, well, good. you know, you were talking about contributing to Africa, but also contributing to the United States. Mm -hmm. And so I'll ask. True. Well, we know how you've contributed in terms of Google and YouTube and <laughs> some of the other technological uh, uh, inputs that you've had. But talk more about just my contribution and engagement. Just in, and in, in terms of how the African Diaspora Network is contributing, in addition right. to a personal, if you want to. Right, right, certainly. So I'll, maybe let's start with the network. Um, so in the network, we have a lot of entrepreneurs, like people who actually build in products and software. And in some cases, they're doing it for the African continent, but in other cases, they're just entrepreneurs, right? So I, I, I'd say that one of the traits that Almas mentioned, which is, um, what we find in several of our members is that they are, they are willing to go, go places others have not gone. They have like a bit of a wandering spirit, right? And you see a lot mm -hmm. of entrepreneurship coming out, the, um, out of the community, which is great. Uh, so several entrepreneurs who have built businesses and continue to build businesses. And it's, again, not unique to just the African diaspora. You see it in the Indian diaspora. You see it in the like several of the other diaspora that's here in Silicon Valley who that started mm -hmm. businesses. Um, personally, my experience has also been um, I'm very engaged in both the, the alumni networks of the, the colleges that I went to. Um, that's also my way of giving back, just like I believe that um, Africa and Ghana specifically like nurtured me and gave me a lot and has made it possible for me to be here and that make me want to give back. I see my alma maters as having provided opportunities for me and I want to make sure that the... Like Dartmouth. Like Dartmouth, And right. do you think that Dartmouth really needs your contribution? <laughs> you know, that's, that's, a, that's a common question people have about big institutions that have large endowments, but the the truth is, if everyone took that perspective, Dartmouth would eventually run out of it, maybe slower than some of the others that are out there. <laughs> but that's going to happen, right? And then more importantly, Dartmouth and other institutions like it, whilst they may not need a few hundred or thousand dollars I may be able to offer them this year, they certainly need my input, right? I mean, my college actually went through some, some very bad um, situations when it came to like sexual assault on campus right and it's it's really uh, my generation of alumni that came together and said okay we need to do something about this um, so that engagement that voice is a is a very important part of what the alumni offer and what the alma mater and, and what about right? having I, I remember visiting Dartmouth by the way as a undergraduate student myself at Howard University um, what about the diversity, I increasing the diversity at Dartmouth? Are you yeah. involved in that in any way? Um, I have not been very active in it. I, I, I believe I've spent a little bit more time like thinking about uh, more where I'm starting from, which is Silicon Valley, and how Dartmouth can be more engaged in Silicon Valley. Um, there's a fund that my class was able to raise to encourage entrepreneurship, so that's an angle I've been pursuing. But it is something I want to also do more of, which is um, figure out how to improve diversity. And as you probably experienced when you went there, and I don't think it's changed much, uh, Dartmouth could be a lot more diverse. So there's, there's a lot of room for improvement when it comes to diversity there as well. Fascinating. So Alma's... It, it's still absolutely amazing, I'm thinking, and I'm still kind of thinking of the 15 people you brought together <laughs> oh. <laughs> to start the, uh, uh -huh. the African Diaspora Network. And so uh, let's, let's talk about the different panels that you've had and, and how these panels were chosen, because they, they run the gamut 
uh, in terms of women's rights, um, in terms of agriculture, in terms of technology, mm -hmm, and how, mm -hmm. did, how was all of that pulled together? Well, I think I'd rather speak about the whole organization because <laughs> th this is just a byproduct of the organization. Ah. And so I, I think to your question, how do you say, because that's probably one of the, 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 the lessons that uh, people can take if um, they have a plan to start an organization. I do believe in engaging people early on to start things that you want to bring communities together. So the African Diaspora Network was just, uh, you know, a work of the heart. And that I had a job too, a full-time job and two children and a husband. And so it's not just this one, but we I've had to do many different things, but my heart kept coming to the African Diaspora Network. I had people who uh, believed in the vision and mission. So one of them is, uh, Dr. Musambi Kanyero, who's going to join us today, but she wasn't able, she's traveling. Uh, uh, she is the CEO of Global Fund for Women. Uh, Musambi and I, we met at Columbia University uh, many years ago. My alma mater. 2005. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a conference there and we met and we just connected. Um, and since then, we've been very, very good friends. And she's been just a fantastic um, uh, supporter and she was the first woman who chaired that first 15 people meeting ah. with the idea that can we do this and i think it, everyone said yes let's do it of course and then you have to go and slave it to make this uh, this, this organization sustain and uh, be what it is today um, we focused i think for many years and bringing people together and really getting the community to come to be a part of the network. I think we've succeeded on that. And then in 2016, we got the attention of the State Department, USAID. We got uh, seed funding from them and a couple of other friends to start the, to, uh, to launch the first symposium. How you do that is also, we have to have, we have committees that we make committees of uh, mm. several people, including Chum has been a part of, oh, I wanna do this session, how can we do this, who can we bring? So once we define what the uh, theme is and uh, we decide how many sessions we wanna have, uh, after that, you just to work it and then you define each of the session and you bring spe speakers that fit that panel session. Was it easy? You mentioned uh, US, uh, USAID. USAID. Did you have to uh, m let them know that this was not somehow some type of subversive organization? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I was lucky because there was a, there was a program that started a few years, well, not a few years now, uh, during the Obama administration, something called IDEA, the International Diaspora Engagement Alliance, that was under the State Department, started by um, uh, Hillary Clinton when she was, I believe, at the State Department at the time. And that program's idea is to do what Chum was talking about. We're not the only diaspora. You've got Irish diaspora, you've got yes. Indian diaspora, but yes. many different diasporas. Yes. Um, and it encompasses all of those groups. The, 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 uh, the premise behind this whole idea is the acknowledgement that the diasporans all over the world have a role to play in making a difference in the countries where they come from. So in the, ki in the, in the case of Africa, uh, the, the diasporans give 30 plus billion dollar per year in remittances to, to the continent. So this is what you send to your family and all. Collectively, it is helping a lot of people. It's also a lot of money. It's almost three times more than what aid that Africa gets from aid. So, so the United States knows about this, and the State Department, which is a, uh, USAID, is a part of the USAID. The USAID is a part of the State Department. Yes. So they knew this, and they were. I mean, I think we were very happy that we were able to get that kind of support. It's always good to be. Could you? Do you recognized. think you could get that support now under we the Trump administration? We got two years. We didn't get for this in the last two years, uh -huh. but we did get for 2016 and 2017. Sure. <laughs> so things are yeah. different. <laughs> things, yes. things are changing. Things are different, and, and you have felt them, the oh. differences. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but then let's look at the positive side of it. 
our community stood up and they said, yeah, we will help you. So we increased oh. our individual giving from the diaspora and Friends of Africa. I also want to shout out to Facebook, Symantec, Ernest & Young, Johnson & Johnson, Global Fund for Women, and others from the community that really said, we'll give. And so we get sponsorship from many of them, which you can see it in the book. Um, so we're very uh, thankful to the community. They right. believe in what we're doing. And so in a way, yes, USAID wasn't able to help for the last two years, but we were able to bring others who yeah, are able did, to. It did increase community engagement. The community yes. really stepped up. And you know, you'd asked the question about uh, how we come up with uh, both our themes and the, the panel sessions we, ca we, we have. Alma has talked about the committees that we build, but we also get a lot of feedback from from the symposium itself. So at the end of the symposium, we, we run surveys, we get a lot of feedback, we get people suggesting things, and we also aggregate all of that information and that helps us plan the next theme and the next set of topics that we want to discuss because we want the community f to feel a part of this. And mm -hmm. I believe over the years, that's continued to make the symposium better and better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's very, very important is in, uh, getting the voice of uh, the people who attend the symposium and you will see it on Monday we will launch the report and the report has a very open transparent way of what people responded to what so that really gives us a great uh, uh, starting point for 2020. Talk about you had I guess 12 panels over the three days and you had how many people participating? Over the two days two together, days, 250 people. 250 people. And uh, who were some of the keynote speakers? You mentioned Ime. Ime. From, yeah, mm -hmm. We have Ime. We have Ash Agabi from uh, Kaneku. Uh, it's a, a life science company based in Berkeley, also a Nigerian founder and CEO. Uh, we had Gretchen Sorensen. She is a strategic uh, a partnership consultant uh, lives in Seattle, and we had Aishetu. Uh, she was phenomenal. She was our first uh, keynote speaker on Thursday during the reception. Say more about her for those who never Aishetu heard of her. Aishetu is uh, now a fellow at uh, Stanford University at the um, career. What is it called? The Distinguished Career Fellow. Uh, she's a Nigerian, um, brilliant entrepreneur. I worked at um, investment bank, I believe. Um, oh, I'm running, forgetting the name, but she worked at investment banking and she has uh, all kind of different investment banking uh, skills. Um, originally, again, from Nigeria, has done very well for herself, and now she's really looking at a different trajectory of her career, and she is a part of the uh, Distinguished Career Fellow at Stanford University, and she really gave a very good presentation about that Africa is a destination for investment, not for aid. That was a really good ah, one. Yeah. Why so? Because when we think of at least traditional ideas, we think of Somalia and maybe mm -hmm. the droughts. In and, Ethiopia. Right. Yes, exactly. And over the years, maybe the coups or the mm -hmm. disruption. The corruption or, and the, the yes. political instability. Yes, I, I think exactly. those are the messages that do carry across. But um, when you see the economic development that's happening across the continent, it's clear that if we would highlight some of those, uh, there could be a very different image of Africa that we present to the rest of the world. Now, uh, another idea or another factor that has been a part of the history is other companies uh. coming in, taking over in terms of mining in South Africa uh, or diamonds or... Mm -hmm. And I, I think now the Chin people from China, the Chinese, have made mm, yeah, various... The contentious case. <laughs> yes. And so I'm just thinking, when you talk about being at the table and other people making decisions, the investments, would they be owned by Africans or owned by outsiders <laughs> needing to be nationalized? So, I mean, it, yeah. obviously, like, Africa has, has, had a, has had a history of being exploited, unfortunately. It's, a, it's an amazing continent when it comes to natural resources, which whether it's people or it's, it's minerals or it's agricultural products, there's been a lot of exploitation uh, over the, the centuries. Um, it's one of the reasons why our take is that the diaspora has to be involved, because we believe that the diaspora has a 
a heart for Africa that involves leaving something for Africa versus extracting things and taking it away because they still see it as their home. And when you see a place as a, a, when you have that home bound, home string connection to a place, you want to actually leave it better than it was, right? Um, so most, most of us in the diaspora recognize that there are issues in the countries from which we, we, we migrated and we want to make them better. And so all our intentions around investments and, and development there are to help the people who are there to have better access and to have opportunities that we didn't have whilst we're there. So we think that's going to be an important part of the conversation. We, of course, there are going to be other multinationals that are going to continue to develop the economies there, which is great. Mm -hmm. But if we're not active as a diaspora and, we, and friends of Africa, people who really want to see developments in the continent, not just businesses that they extract value from, um, if we're not part of that conversation, then yes, we run the risk of continuing this trend of exploitation. That's actually a very important uh, reason, one of the most important reasons why the diaspora needs to be engaged. Um, decisions, so the diaspora is a diaspora. We left home for different reasons. So I think the accountability, whether to continue to see Africa being exploited, whether it's by China and others, is the role of the governments as well. So we do want to make sure that African governments uh, step back and say, okay, what are we doing with the decision that we're making? Is it going to allow uh, for these investments to enable and contribute to the economic well-being of Africa? Or are we going to bring um, uh, investors that are going to extract and then leave? So, or are they going to make the continent a better place than then they found it before? So, so those are decisions that can be done mostly at the, at the government level. And, and how can you, I, I'm looking at leaders um, and the reason sometimes for being leaders uh, for their own personal power and wealth, how, how then do you have the influence that's necessary to have right. leaders thinking more of the people and power to the people than power in, for their own right, for their own pocketbooks? So, so it starts. It's class, it starts uh, one country and one community and one region and one person at a time in so many ways. So, the power of advocacy is very, very much alive in Africa. So you see people demonstrating, really asking for rights and also for economic rights and human rights and all the different rights that they need. Um, and I think that's very, very important. I also think that we have some um, countries right now doing very well in uh, peaceful transition. Ghana is one of the best examples. Um, name, name several. <laughs> I think Rwanda is in a yeah, good place. Yeah, Rwanda is in a good place. Ah. The, Rwanda is certainly in a much better place. Like South Africa has been very stable for a very long time. Kenya is in a good place. They've had a little bit of friction in the past, but it's been very stable for a while. Ghana, of course, has been very stable for a very for long a time. For a very long time. Ethiopia is uh, getting into that place of stability, okay. still some challenges. You know, when you're a big country, it's always difficult. Nigeria, it has its uh, challenges, but at least, at least they are very forceful in their voice. So we could see some change hopefully happening. So well. when you talk about investments, in the continent, and I'm thinking in terms of Americans, they're thinking of jobs going out of the country mm. at lower wages than people within the country would get. And so is this a concern as you talk about investments in Africa and developing mm. the country and, and providing more jobs to people? What does that mean to American workers? Yeah, that's a that's a good that's a point, good point yeah. to discuss. Um, generally, Africa has not been a large outsourcing destination, say versus like Asia in general, or India, um, or India, right? Which is yeah part of the Asian continent. But um, Africa, it's well, the investments we've been seeing in Africa actually have been creating jobs in Africa that are not necessarily moving away from the U.S. Again, because Africa just has quite an abundance of resources. It's a difference between take raw materials out of Africa and go process them somewhere else and then sell them around the world versus build factories there and let the processing be done on the continent, right? Um, 
still the design and so forth is being done in other countries. Um, but today, it's not the case that people are taking, say, cocoa is one of the common uh, raw materials that comes out of, of Ghana, um, taking cocoa and bringing it to the States and then processing it here. Really, it's more that they are taking it to various places in Europe and processing it at a much higher cost. And if uh, plants and factories would be created in Ghana that would process that, it would create jobs, but it would also mean that the the, it would incentivize more Ghanaian uh, crop producers to produce more cocoa. That should actually increase the, the market for chocolate production in general. Right? So I think that's the sort of thinking we have to apply when it comes to uh, opportunities in these developing markets. And Africa, of course, is one of them. But I think in general that, yes, there's a simplistic view of it where you'd say, well, jobs are moving from one place to another. But there's an acceleration that happens because more of uh, more of those opportunities get created. Like more chocolate products gets created is actually good for the world's economy, including mm -hmm. the US, yeah. right? But it means taking taking production closer to where the crops are actually being produced. Now, another question too, I'm thinking of the environment, because as countries become more and more industrialized, mm -hmm. like India, like China, you see an increase in pollution. Yes. And uh, for Africa right now, and I'm thinking since so many resources have been tapped into and taken out of the country, you, the exploitation, what does that mean? What, what can we look at in terms of development in Africa and environmental standards? So I think this is a ch an interesting question for Africa because you have to understand that Africa hasn't polluted yet, as others have. <laughs> we so haven't gotten to that point we yet. We haven't gotten to that point. In fact, uh, we will be at that point. When we reach the point where we feel like we're polluting, I think it would be like Africa has grown in a way that Chun was talking about. Manufacturing would happen and processing would happen in country where you have uh, the, the, the issue of environmental right. and uh, other things you can talk about. But still, uh, there are issues of uh, environment. And in fact, uh, the uh, challenge right now for Africa is um, the climate itself. When, when there is an environmental change uh, in the world, it actually impacts negatively in Africa, especially farmers. Because of that, you will see a lot of intra-Africa migration, so people leaving from where they came from or their own space because they can't uh, do their farming into other places. When you do that, you're actually taking resources from the other communities, so it's a burden to society in some ways. So those are some things that the, the continent needs to do. But in general, in terms of pollution, I don't think we've reached that point where many others, it's a problem to other people, but for, for Africa, we, we really, I, I per personally would like to see us reach a point where things are manufactured and produced in the well, continent. I, I'm thinking given what's happening in the industrialized countries, what has happened mm -hmm. in terms of environmental concerns and, right. and e exploitation of the environment, perhaps, as Africa develops its own resources more, those in the country can, can learn from the other experiences right. of right. other countries mm -hmm. to avoid mm -hmm. some of the same problems. Which and, I think, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, they are doing so solar uh, right. uh, technology is in abundance. It makes sense because uh, it's sunny. Everywhere oh. you go. Oh. Yeah, so, so the good news is the good these news. conversations have happened earlier. Yes. So if we think of the African continent is going through a development cycle that is somewhat behind some of the other continents we've seen. The great news is, in that arc, the concept of conservation, of um, thinking about the environment, is those conversations are happening sooner. But this goes back to the point we've been having about like politics and policy, right? I mean, let's remember that when we talk about exploitation, it's not a one-side thing. Like you said, it requires like governments that are willing to essentially sacrifice the future of their countries for some short-term financial gain, right? And it's it's that incentive that provides the, the environment or creates the environment for exploitation. It's also that sort of thinking that could potentially create an environment where we're not thinking about sustainability and the, the environment. But if we continue to 
see progress in policy and government, we, we should be having those conversations. And the good thing is we're already beginning to see it. So talking about solar energy, a lot of the energy investment that's happening on the continent today is actually happening in more of these renewables like solar, right? Mm -hmm. So in the, the Southeast African countries, energy is like a big thing and a lot of um, energy investments, opportunities that happen and a lot of them are around solar, which is really good news. Fantastic. So that's a mitigation yes. thing that we do. We yes. don't have to go through what other developed countries have gone. So Africa can really disrupt that system and really go through a different kind of growth rather than uh, hurting its own population. And, and maybe and, uh, show, uh, become a model in some ways for the rest of the world. I mean, after all, Pliny the Elder did say there are good things that come out of Africa yes. that the world Most of can, the time. <laughs> that can, can take a look at. In the few minutes that we have left, I still have more questions for you, as you can imagine. <laughs> but I'm thinking here's an opportunity perhaps to talk about uh, whatever it is I haven't asked you that you think is important. Is there something that you would like to share? Well, I would like to share that. Um, we would like to see more of the corporations in Silicon Valley look at the African diaspora network as a place of true diversity, not just a diversity in talk. It really is a true diversity in, uh, in inclusion in action. And we would like to see more of the corporations to be a part of our, our network. And we're, as I said earlier, we have some. We want to continue to grow that. And what's in it for them? That's a very good point. What's in it for them is really that whole understanding of cultural understanding. There is uh, access to talent that they may not have had. So a lot of entrepreneurs and, and of course engineers, brilliant engineers that come from many different parts of the United States and congregate in one place every year um, at the, te at the uh, Computer History Museum. What could be better than that? Google is just next door to the Computer History Museum. We would like them to see it also as a place of interaction with other people whom they may not have had an opportunity to meet with, but also knowledge exchange and knowledge sharing. Google is doing a lot of work in Africa, so are others. And so I think we would like to continue to, uh, we have work to do, but we also want to use your, uh, uh, you know, this show to uh, really tell our story. The other thing is, um, our board is very diverse, uh, so we have a very strong board with uh, uh, incredible and impeccable background, like you've heard from Chum. Uh, we would like to continue to use their voices and their means to really get access to many different opportunities within the United States and also in many parts of the world. But we also have some work to do in really truly engaging the Silicon Valley community, so we would like to see more of them and many of them come to the uh, symposium in 2020. Shum, just a few seconds left. Yeah, I don't so, want to leave you out. No, no thank <laughs> you. Um, I'd add to that that we'd love to engage or expand the community further. As we mentioned, the ADN is designed not just for Africans in the diaspora, but also for friends of Africa. So anyone that cares about this this continent and wants to see progress on the continent, so we really want to just open it up and invite more people to get engaged and to get part of the, become part of the story. Well, it's a, a big story, 54, 55 countries. Yes. And um, uh, people who are coming as a part of the African diaspora network to share their talents and the gifts that they have in this country to benefit this, not only this country, but their home countries. I'm thinking what could be better? That's right. true. <laughs> Can you think of anything better? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank well, you. I, I thank you so much for sharing uh, your histories, your backgrounds, what you're doing now. And I certainly like to thank our viewers for watching. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you so much. For thank you. This was nice. You're right. It went by. I was going to say, let's keep going. <laughs> I wish I could. Yeah, thank In fact, you. what I wanted to do is talk about what you're doing at the UN and also.